both in the United States and in Western Europe, a lot of discussion in our cultural and political landscape today has centered around the idea of, of populism. In this video, I'm going to be discussing what populism is and why I don't see populism as the way forward for our culture. Now, populism is something that's very difficult to define, and I have looked at a number of articles. These are articles within scholarly journals, and I've gone back then in history to try to get behind some of the current discussion, which is often so politically heated and biased that it's difficult to find a clear objective definition. So I went back into a number of journals in the 1970s when there was a rise of populism then and, and even farther back into the beginnings of the, the 20th century and the end of the 19th. And after all of that work, I really have not been able to find a coherent definition of populism. Uh, but the generally agreed upon kind of characteristics that define populism are a movement, a political movement within a culture which appeals to the common person over against the elite. And there is this perceived distance between the common person who is much more pure and then the corrupt elite. Generally, these movements are spurred on by a charismatic individual or multiple charismatic individuals who set themselves up as leaders over the people who care about the common people and who are going to fight the corrupt elite. And this then is what for populace is ultimately going to lead to cultural change and justice for the common person who is being oppressed by whoever the elite may be within that particular populist movement. And there are a number of these throughout history. We tend to think of it in terms of the 20th century United States and Western Europe, but populist movements have been part of societies and the history of rebellions and the state and how decisions are made pretty much since the beginning of the existence of society itself. So if you search, for example, for historical peasants' revolts or peasants' rebellions, and I'm not just talking about the 16th century German peasant revolt, which most of my viewers who are Lutherans <laughs> probably know well, there have been many movements that have been spurred on by, again, a charismatic individual who's taking the sides of the peasants. Usually this leads to some kind of revolt or some kind of attempted takeover that the goal is to establish someone in power who cares about the common person and who is not as corrupt as, as the current elites are. Now, just by observing how this happens in history and looking at the results of these various movements, they are generally unsuccessful. By and large, the majority of peasant revolts, the majority of populist movements to try to change things from the bottom, from the common people, they do not generally have an effect. There have been some exceptional circumstances in which there is some change there, or a regime is overthrown and somebody else is put in place. However, oftentimes there is much corruption, if not more corruption, from the new leader that has been put in place, as is the case uh, with the prior one. So in light of all of this, I want to say that there are several problems, I think, with populist movements today. And populist movements, historically, at least in the United States, have generally been associated with the left. And so if you read some of the historiographies of the history of the United States with, for example, the new left in the middle of the 20th century, or the old left prior to that as well, the left has tended to be the one that has looked at history as a kind of battle between the pure common people and those who are in power. And the assumption is whatever group is in power is necessarily corrupt. And there is a necessary liberation that needs to happen by those who are oppressed. And of course, you see how this generally fits the progressive narrative. So populist movements were often associated with Marxism. Sometimes populist movements rejected both the right and the left. That was often the case, actually, such as late 19th century American populist movements, where there was a people's party that was formed in opposition to, to both of those trying to actually look for the, the benefit of the common man. So by and large, populist movements have tended to be from the left, and it makes sense. Marxist ideology is inherently, to some degree, populist. It is dependent on the idea that there is this corrupt bourgeoisie who is oppressing and attacking the proletariat and 
the proletariat needs to rise up and then put one of their own in charge. So the question today then is, what about on the right? Why is it that on the right today, we have the same kind of populist movements that are dependent upon these same kinds of class divides and divisions that we find in something like the earlier Marxist movements? Now, some of this is just obvious as we look around. It is true that the elites of the United States are deeply corrupt. I don't think that there is any doubt about that. I mean, we have the stories of Jeffrey Epstein and the kinds of people who have been protected. We know that there is deep-seated corruption in leaders of industry, in our leaders of business and government and education. There is no doubt that there is a corrupt elite and that there are networks of individuals who are working for their own self-interest, who collaborate together to make sure that certain regulations are passed or certain laws get buried so they never have to be voted on. And there is this growing divide between who are considered the elites and then who are the common people. And there are a lot of factors that, that go into this. I think Patrick Deneen does a pretty good job in his, his newer book, Regime Change, where he speaks about the distinction between who is considered that kind of elite class within the United States. And we've shifted from a time where you had a kind of American aristocracy. And these were the old families. You can read old Edith Wharton novels to see at the end of the 19th century, the prominence of certain families who could trace their heritage all the way back to the Plymouth colonies. Then you see this move toward industrial leaders. And now we have this managerial elite. And the managerial elite is different in many ways from those other two groups because the managerial elite is far more distanced from the life of the common people than either of those other two groups. Not to say that there wasn't corruption there either, but there was a kind of shared life or existence of the elites lived in the same general areas as those who were not the common people. So even as I look around upstate New York, which was largely settled mid-19th century, if you look at the mansions that were owned by the people of great influence, the leaders of industry, they're often seated in exactly the same town as that of the common people. In other words, the person who, say, owns the plant where the people are working is going to live in the same area as where the people are. So there isn't this strong disconnect that there is today. Now, what happens with the managerial elite is that everything is done at a distance. And now that we have remote work, you have people that go to very specific cities and come to those places with a shared common ideology. You have this complete disconnection between those people and the common people so that they have no idea who they are. They have no idea what they are like, yet they are the ones that are making decisions for those people. A great example of this is what you saw with, with Budweiser and their advertising campaign that you all probably know about. And that advertising campaign, we, we had a video of the head of marketing there who was an Ivy League educated woman who had, was completely divorced from the average consumer of Budweiser, who is probably not at all the kind of person that she is. And if you listen to the way that she speaks about marketing, that she speaks about what is going to appeal or how, how the business is going to grow, it's completely disconnected from the customer base. And you can say the same thing with Disney. That's another great example of this. But what's happening today is that that divide between who are the educated elites who generally live in cities and then the common people, it's growing and it's increasing in that separation between those two groups of individuals. With all, with all of that being said, you may think I sound like a populist <laughs> because I'm acknowledging that populist movements are reacting to genuine issues. However, I don't think populism is at all the solution to the problems that we are seeing today. When there is this rhetoric from the left that is, you know, us versus you kind of rhetoric, which is largely directed toward those who do not live in metropolitan areas. And the language is often expressing that these people are dumb. They don't know what they're talking about. They are clueless. They're not as enlightened as the people who are well-educated who live in cities are. When the, the population of those rural areas who is disconnected from, from that elite class, when that population starts to echo the rhetoric throwing it in the other direction, all you are doing is now increasing a class war. 
This is something that I often see in my own life, just in comments that I get because of the fact that I live in a liberal area in the Northeast and I am involved in uh, campus ministry at an Ivy League institution. I didn't attend an Ivy, to be clear, but I am deeply ingrained and enmeshed in that culture. So people often looked at, look at me with skepticism and there are people that will look at nearly anything I say and immediately jump on the attack of you're one of them because you are, I don't know, too kind to those people. You live in an area that I don't like. And what you have is this just continuing clash or this battle that is really fueled by the left, but in many ways the right is taking the bait and pushing back. And I wanna say that is not at all what is going to create a solution. If you look at movements throughout history that have had actual success pushing against corruption, they are generally not going to be those kind of populist movements or revolts. Those things almost always fail. The movements that do have success are those that incorporate the different classes of people, whether you have the agrarian classes and you have the academic class in society, you have the nobility of some kind, whether it's, you know, you have an official title or not. There are people that take on that kind of aristocratic role in every society, no matter what. It's better to acknowledge it rather than deny it. But if we acknowledge that these are simply different vocations, different callings within society, and that we must work together and coexist and each do our part, that is the only way that we can really move toward a stable society that has a future. My kind of my plea perhaps here to conservatives, especially those who are part of that you know, agrarian class, is to say cultural change is not going to happen if you do not also have the academic class creating a new academy, creating a an academic and intellectual culture that is rooted in the inheritance of the Christian West. You simply are not going to have this any kind of long-term change or gains in society if all you are doing is appealing to the mass population without any influence upon the leaders of society. And so what we need in order to move forward toward a society that actually has a coherent set of beliefs a coherent set of values that has anything but resentment toward the past, we need to have those who are in academic fields, who are building culture, who are writing the academic materials, the books, we need people creating the art that is going to sustain and uplift culture in the long term. What I see in populism is a desire for some kind of immediate gains and immediate change. Now, in the short term, you may have great immediate gains, but the work that tends to last and tends to have an impact upon culture generations into the future are going to be those things which may not see immediate results. Because actual change and actual impact upon culture tends to take a very long time. And so if you actually want that to happen, we need to create stable institutions. We need to have roots for people to get training and education in what is true, what is good, and what is beautiful. We need to have roots for those individuals to get into places within our society where they are going to have an impact, a significant impact upon other people who are going to be trained to be the leaders of our society, whether it's industry or politics or writing or music or whatever realm it may be in. And so often I see these people who make comments on the things that I do and say, well, you're not having the impact that this person has because you don't have X number of viewers. That's really irrelevant. That's not my strategy. It's never been my strategy. You can have an insane amount of numbers of people watching what you're doing and your content can be irrelevant within three, four years because society moves very quickly. You need only look back at television shows that nobody remembers, that millions of people are watching every day. And so we need things that are sustainable. 
And so we need more than mocking the left. We need more than just appealing to this us versus them mentality constantly. Instead, we need people that are delving into the roots of Western culture and are providing work that is going to last, not just in this generation, not just in the next generation, but things that are going to impact people many generations into the future. So when you're looking at populism, you're looking at immediate gains when you are delving deeper and you are promoting the continuance of the Christian West through academic disciplines and the arts, you are going to create things that are going to feed the soul of a nation rather than just immediate political gains. And those are the things that are going to have long-term effects generations ahead. Even if it's the case that the material that I produce along with others that are doing similar things, it does not have an immediate impact on our culture and our culture completely collapses. At the very least, what I can say is this, that we have provided the materials that out of the destruction of our culture, people can use to then rebuild. And perhaps that's what happens. So to be clear, I'm not making this to you know, insult anybody or say, I don't think that you're doing a good thing if you're appealing to you know, the mass population. That's, that's not the case at all. What, I, what I'm simply saying is that if we want to have an approach that's actually going to have an impact, we need people in the various classes of culture. And this idea that there is a hierarchy and distinction of classes is an inherently conservative idea. There is no such thing as conservatism without hierarchy, without the understanding that there are certain people that have positions in society that are going to be more powerful than others. That's Edmund Burke, that's Russell Kirk, that's even someone like Martin Luther. And to just echo this kind of populist, anti-authority type of rhetoric, all that's going to do is lead you toward the same road that the Peasants' Revolt did lead to, which was a violent attempt at overthrow and the destruction of those peasants. Why is it that the Lutheran Reformation had a significant impact upon culture in the entirety of Europe and then later the United States, whereas the Anabaptist movements didn't? It's precisely because the Lutheran movement involved the elites. It involved princes. It involved the establishment of academies. It involved the production of great music. The Anabaptists had influence on their own group, but they never had that kind of mass impact precisely because they were not a group that had the elites. So anyway, here are just some of my thoughts. I'd love to hear your comments and thoughts on this below. Make sure you subscribe and we'll see you in the next video. God bless.